Hello and welcome to the Tour de France podcast with humansinvent.com. I'm Richard Moore. I am tonight with Lionel Burney. Evening, Richard. And very excitingly, a, a new guest, an international guest, Matt Bowden. Matthew Bowden, which do you prefer? Matt Bowden from Velo News. Bodin. 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 Say hello, Matt. Hello. Pleasure to be here. So, first of all, Lionel, can you uh, describe where we are as you do so beautifully every evening? Well, we're sitting outside the press room in Gap, mm. lying on the grass, um, very relaxed. Can just see the mountains over one direction. A Looming burden. up behind Matt. A big verd, well, basically sort of wedged in between a marquee and an industrial unit and a car park. But we can see beautiful, beautiful mountains in the in the uh, in the distance. There. And I can hear a creek. I can hear a creek. In the a di- creek right next to us as well. We call that a river. Well, that'd actually be more like a brook. A brook. We call it a burn in Scotland. Actually, yeah. any other any other descriptions for the <laughs> the water that's running past us? It might might provide a nice background noise. I'm not sure. Right, today's stage, not a lot happened until the end when it became quite exciting, uh, which was good because we had a massive long drive today. The stage was 168 kilometres, we had to drive 275 to get here, which meant that we missed most of it, but we actually didn't miss all that much, I don't think. At the end there, there was a lot of attacks. Chris Froome estimated there were about 10 attacks that Richie Port mainly had to respond to on the uh, Col de Mons. And they responded to them all very well. Richard Port was, I think, distance just going over the over the top. But on the descent, which is a is a very famous descent, uh, owing to the fact that in 2003 that's where uh, Josiba Balocchi crashed on wet tarmac, on melting tarmac conditions quite similar to today, very hot, and he lost control of his bike, went down incredibly heavy. It was as though he'd been dropped from a plane. I mean, he just hit the ground, and he never really recovered. That was effectively the end of his career. Uh, Armstrong, meanwhile, took evasive action by riding over a field, and uh, we spotted that point today. Che- cheating. Cheating? Yeah. You're not accusing Armstrong uh, of cheating, are you? Uh, Why not? Uh, Is that we'll low? Spoil it. That's oh, low. That was a bit of, I mean, I mean, we say we will. That was a bit of, that was a bit of riding brilliance there. <laughs> We've got an American. Don't offend the uh, our, our American guest, yeah, please. I mean, I mean, if that were if that would have been a British rider, you would have celebrated that for a decade. Yeah, it was it was a it was a wonderful moment actually. <laughs> and then two years ago, we were we were back here, and it was rain. It was very very wet, and it was a, a descent that probably ended the chances of of Andy Schleck, who complained afterwards about how dangerous it had been. Alberto Contador was one of the main aggressors on that day, and he was again today. Him and Kreuziger were taking turns to attack on the descent. And Chris Froome at the end was pretty unhappy. I mean, it takes quite a lot to rile him, and he seemed quite upset and sort of urging riders not to take unnecessary risks. And I remember Andy Schleck doing that two years ago, and I felt at the time it was an error to do so. Uh, I don't know if that's your impression as well tonight, Matt. If it's an error to, to warn riders to not take unnecessary risks. I mean, yeah. you know, when he, when, I, when he said it the first time, I kind of perked up a bit and thought, well, that's, that's an odd thing to say. I mean... Because he's in the yellow jersey, he has to defend the yellow jersey. You can choose not to on a downhill attack like that. I mean, in all in all actuality, he'd maybe lose 40 seconds on a day like today if he didn't chase. Mm. But, I mean, as one reporter asked, if you thought it was too fast, why did you follow the wheel? And he, Froom, you know, I think in the first bit of emotion he showed in the entire tour verbally, at least with the press, said, you know what, you're right, maybe I should just let Contador ride away with the yellow jersey. So, I mean, he's he's compelled to cover the attacks and, and I don't think I think it's a, a misstep to, to say riders shouldn't take unnecessary risks in the descents. I mean you don't have to go with them especially as our, our good friend Chiro asked the first question he asked him about the descent that is coming on Thursday of course of Alp Duez which a lot of riders have been speaking about as being particularly dangerous we've talked about it a few times on our podcast for you know there are all sorts of reasons why this is noteworthy from the, the marmots that will be stressed out apparently by the visit of the tour may not eat enough uh, as a result of stress to have enough sort of fuel going into hibernation. And, and so this is a worry. Chris Room didn't actually mention that, but um, the descent itself is very, very dangerous, apparently. Yeah, I can see this brewing up over the next 48 hours to sort of get the, the first ascent of uh, Alpe d'Huez and the descent of the Col de Serene sort of unofficially neutralised um, because the weather forecast is not looking great either. There could be 
thunder, could be a bit of rain. Um, we know that that descent of the Col de Seren is... Thunder and lightning, very, very frightening. Yeah, indeed. Um, we know that that, uh, that descent is um, treacherous in the dry. Um, it's, it's narrow, there's sort of off-camber bits where the, the road actually sort of seems to throw you off to uh, off to the edge and there's not a lot to break the fall. There's, um, there's no barriers... Um, uh, and I can see, you know, perhaps Froome was calculating a bit today, um, just planting the seed that don't want to be pushing the limit too much on the descent on Thursday because, you know, that is the sort of place where if people were to put him under pressure repeatedly, um, you know, mistakes could be made. And so perhaps today, I agree with Matt, you know, he, he wasn't compelled to go with the, with the moves and let's not forget, it is a bike race and in order to win a bike race, you have to be proficient going down as well as up um, so it will be interesting to see if the forecast is correct and the weather does turn a little bit tomorrow and Thursday it will be very interesting to see what happens on um, the outdoor stage all, all good points I do, I do take a little bit of an issue with the fact that, I mean it's, it will be a dangerous descent, we know that. They've already raced it, and Tony Martin, I believe, already went on record sort of questioning its safety, but it's on the parkour, it's part of the 100th Tour de France, it's a bike race still, and I think that, you know, barring any hail or ice or whatever, I mean, I think that that is part of the bike race, and I, I, think, that, I think that for the yellow jersey to, to try to discourage attacks is, um, I, I, I think it... Lacks a bit of uh, lacks a bit of class. In my I'm not sure if it lacks class. I think it just shows slight naivety. Um, I think I think when Contador reads that, um, as he will when he reads my report tomorrow morning, will he, he read will your report no, tomorrow probably morning? not. But he will <laughs> stick it through Google Translate. Uh, no, he will he will be rubbing his hands with glee, won't he? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the point you make is that it's a bike race and. Part of this, the bike, the bike race, as Lionel said, is 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 being able to descend. And this is a fascinating topic, I think, because I think we're seeing increasingly that riders, and we've seen it especially at this tour, riders and teams are really using their imagination uh, and coming up with plans. And I think it was a it was a it was a plan today to to put Froome under that sort of pressure, and just to see how we would respond. And you know any vulnerability that he shows, they're not going to drop him going uphill. So they've got to try to drop him going downhill. If Contador. Um, it, is to, the, the point of descending is you, you have to take calculated risks. Um, he accused Contador of taking uncalculated risks, and that's why he fell off. Um, Chris Froome doesn't have to take uncalculated risks. If he, if, if, if he thinks that Contador is taking uncalculated risks, let him go, because he will probably fall off. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think that that, that was, it was slightly naive of him to, to flag this up as, you know, as an area of, of vulnerability. There are a lot of, not just Thursday, but there are a lot of, a lot of descents still to come. And that is one thing that uh, Sky does nearly everything well, but what they don't do well is unpredictability. Good and that's, point. that's why we saw them, you know, I don't want to say struggle because they were remarkably consistent, at least in the classics, but that's why that team hasn't said we want to win a classic and lined up and won a classic because... You know, it's very difficult to, to account for all the different variables in a classic as it is in descending. I mean, that's bike racing. There's no science in descending. Interesting. I mean, we were talked about this after the Giro as well, of course, where Nibali, obviously, early on in the race, considered the descents a place where Wiggins might be vulnerable, and so it proved. And Wiggins was so shaken up by his, his crash in the Giro, he never got his confidence back. And I'm not suggesting that could happen with Chris Froome, but he did have another wobble after... Uh, the you know the the the, the initial crash. He, I'm not sure if he sort of crashed properly or just had one of those incidents where he was sort of straddling his bike, running along with his bike. We've all we've all done it and managed to hold it upright. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't either see really what happened to Contador, but he did seem to hurt himself a little bit. He was looking at his arm. I saw a picture on Twitter at least. He had just posted of his uh, of his skinned up knee, it looked right. like and. But the but you know to your point earlier he didn't he seemed undaunted and he said tomorrow again exclamation point of course tomorrow's a time trial I don't know how much downhill attacking you'll do in a time trial <laughs> although there are two very technical descents in the time trial so you know I, I don't know I think it just goes to goes to what you said earlier that Contador's uh, he's unfazed and he's this is great for the tour I'm, he made the tour in 2011 very exciting as well love him or hate him he's aggressive and when he's got nothing to lose I remember that stage up Duez in 2011 which was a short stage. And he ripped it up, and he caused all kinds of damage. And he, he eventually blew up himself on uh, Alpe d'Huez, and Pierre Roland won the stage. But 
my God, it was an exciting stage. And, you know, his presence, if only for that, is, is welcome, isn't it? Well, he's got three days when potentially he could do that. Um, the Alpe d'Huez, of course, Le Grand Bournon, and then particularly Annecy Semnoz, which is the kind of, you know, the real nasty sting in the tail at the end of a difficult week in the Alps. I mean, today was no picnic, was it? They put... Yeah, that's the other thing to bear in mind. It was a quick it, sandwich in a it, petrol station. It was, it was a. It's, that's the other thing to bear in mind. At the start of this last week, six days of racing. Okay, discount the the final day to Paris, but it, the wearing down process kind of started today. They could have taken it a, a lot easier than they did, and and um, Saxo chose not to. And so, it's all about trying to get to a stage where you know they they, they at least look like they're going to see whether or not Froome. Um, has a limit, has a point to which he can be pushed. And that last climb, I mean, Matt, you rode it in the attack last week. Ah, well, I was going to get onto that, yeah. It's, Knowledge. It, it, is a, it is a brute, and it's the sort of place where a rider who's been under pressure for a whole week could potentially be vulnerable. Um, but, but, of course, you know, the, you know, Contador's got to have the legs to keep keep applying that pressure daily, and, and that's, that's going to be a big ask, mm. I think. Well, speaking of Saxo, as we were there, I spoke this morning to Nicholas Roach, uh, who is one of Contador's teammates and has been uh, quite active in it. He was very active on the, the Friday stage, the crosswind stage, um, helping out his, his team leader. Uh, so I spoke to him uh, briefly at the start this morning, and here's what he had to say. Nicholas, this is a, it's a very different role you have in your new team. How are you enjoying it? Well, I'm enjoying it fully. You know, it's good to see that uh, Alberto, Roman and, and even Michael are, are up there. So, you know, it, it's, um, it's great when you do the work and actually uh, it's useful. So, uh, no, I'm, I'm enjoying this tour. It's been a good tour so far. How does it compare to leading a team yourself and having all that kind of pressure and responsibility? What, what, what's the difference that you feel when you're actually... There's actually a, a lot of responsibilities uh, at the moment, maybe actually even more, because, uh, you know, when you're playing a role to try and win the, in a team that's trying to win the Tour de France, it's so important to be involved and focus at 100%. And uh, if you have a bad day, you could actually, uh, you know, compromise the tactic of the team to, to maybe try and change things around. As, you know, if you have a bad day when you're leading a team, well, tough, but it's only your, your own performance that's kind of put down. And what's Contador like as a leader? He's great. He's uh, very talkative. At dinner, we have some good conversations about the, the, the stages and what can be done, what can't be done, uh, how to do it, and, uh, you know, when are we going to do it, and, uh, you know, he... He's always good about talking about advices, and you know it's um, it's a good guy to, to have. Can he still beat Chris Froome? Do you think? I don't know. I certainly hope so, and I think the whole team hopes so. And we wouldn't be at the start today if we were already beaten. Cycling race uh, is so beautiful because anything can change at any time, and uh, it's just the riders that uh, can change the scenarios. So your team has some some more plans to shake things up a bit this week. Well, I don't know if the word is to shake things up. It'd be stupid to sit around and wait to get our bottom kicked. So we have to try things. This is a humansinvent.com Tour de France podcast with Richard Moore and Lionel Burney. I'm with Lionel Burney and Matt Bowden. I keep wanting to say Baudin. Have you, not thought, have you not thought about making it more French sounding? Well, the problem is if I make it more French sounding and I come to cover the Tour de France, then people think that I can speak French well, and that's just it's that's not the truth at all. Really. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Um, just before we leave today's stage, we were, we were just talking there while we were listening to Nicholas Roach about uh, the, the, the gesture that Alberto Contador made at Quintana when when Froome, Contador and Quintana, and sorry, and Port, Richie Port, caught up with the, the leading group again. Um, now, Movistar seemed to be driving that group, and there is this question of etiquette when the yellow jersey has some misfortune, crashes, um, or even you know any of the main contenders, should the should the group wait? And I asked Richie Port afterwards whether he thought the group should wait. And he thought, he said, I thought that they probably should, but it's a bike race and, you know, we've got to expect that. Um, I don't know. I think, I, I think there's no love lost between Movistar and Contador and Saxo. I think there's a bit of a rivalry, a bit of a subplot to this tour is a rivalry between those teams. Not really sure what the origins are of that. But, um, but yeah, Contador didn't seem too happy, did he? No, it, it didn't. But, uh, you know, it's hard to tell how much of that's the effects of a crash that had just happened, and maybe he's sort of all jacked up on that. And it seemed like he'd lost his big gear, too, so he was all spun mm, out. Mm. Um, yeah, and you just saw him come through the group and give a thumbs up, and uh, it was it was very clear that he was communicating a thumbs up to Quintana, was it? It was an, an ironic thumbs up. Uh, yeah, it? and it was... Uh, I, I, know, I know the Americans don't do irony, but... Well, we, we try and we just 
I mean, we just try. I thought your father told you it was the lowest form. Well, he told me sarcasm was the lowest oh, sorry, form. sorry, sarcasm. Which is different than a dramatic or a situational irony, which yeah. takes some engineering. But <laughs> back back to it. Um, I had I had heard that Quintana had been on the front driving the pace after the yellow jersey and Contador had been gapped off due to that crash. And uh, I think that Contador had taken some issue with it. Now, I don't know exactly what else. I think there's a... All of these kind of gestures get analysed, don't they? And and we're sometimes, I think, in danger of of having this kind of kid gloves approach when something happens to a rider. I mean, let, you know, it, we've said it is a bike race. Mm. The idea is to get to the finish as, as quickly as possible. Obviously, you don't want to see people taking blatant advantage of somebody else's misfortune, and there are those unwritten rules of etiquette um, that you don't attack people when they've, you know, had punctures or, or mechanical problems or, or, a, or a, a fall but you know at the end of the day you know we, we want to see them race we don't want them to be neutralizing mm. everything every every sort of 50k because there's been some kind of incident well let's say Contador attacks Froome on a descent mm. Froome crashes as a result of trying to follow Contador does Contador then have to sit up and wait I mean, I don't think you should have to. No. That's a good point. I mean, we had it with Chaingate, didn't we? And mm. Slightly different, slightly different, I think. But, yeah, it's always, a, it's always an interesting talking point, I think. Um, and I think there's a certain point in the race as well where these rules shouldn't apply. You know, I, I wouldn't sort of suggest a, 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 a time cut like the feed zone lasts a certain, you know. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that after 10K it's okay. But I think there's a certain point when the race is on and, and, and it's, it would be silly to, to neutralise it. You're listening to the Tour de France podcast with humansinvent.com and Sharp. Let's, let's finish with uh, today and, and look back at yesterday's rest day, which was quite pleasant because we didn't have to do a long drive. What wasn't that pleasant was the Team Sky press conference uh, first thing in the morning at 10 o'clock. First thing that wasn't pleasant about it was the fact that it was, we were told in advance, 15 minutes. Now that's pretty unusual. A lot of people, I think, had travelled a long way to get there for their 15 minutes. And it was quite a fraught affair. It, it was quite, there was quite a tense, uh, even slightly hostile atmosphere. And I think that's because it was 15 minutes, although actually it was 12, I counted. Um, and I think that meant that, that journalists uh, were very focused with their questions. Um, those questions were dominated by doping questions, as I think they, they have to be, um, because we are covering the Tour de France. Um, the frustration, and it was articulated by one of our colleagues, Matt Dickinson, quite well this morning, is that the question is always essentially the same. Are you doping? It's variations on that question. There's nothing tangible, there's nothing new that, to, to really ask. And I can, I, I can understand, obviously I understand why the question is asked, clearly. But I also understand the frustration at, at the, the question being repeated without any kind of nothing new. Froome actually was asked tonight if he had any TUEs, any therapeutic use exemptions, and he... He, took, he, he didn't particularly like the question, he said he thought it was personal, but he said he had no problems saying that he has no TUEs at this tour, which is, which is good to hear. Just to clarify, a TUE is basically permission from the race doctor to take a medication that mm. is um, not necessarily banned, but is prescribed. And so we have a suspicion that that has been abused it has, in the it, past. It, ha- it probably has been abused in the past probably to, is give, being abused. to give larger doses of particular drugs or to just give to give a particular medicine that does have a um, either a, you know, a, a performance enhancing mm. um, effect or even side effect. And um, one of the suspicions is that in the past riders have used this exemption um, rule to um, dose up on things that are giving them a, a bit of an edge. So it was, Cortisone, it was, things like yeah, that. It was, yeah, it was, it, was in, it was interesting to hear that question answered by Froome and for him to say that he's not using any TUEs but I think we're in danger here of um, getting into an area where you know for example say for example Froome developed some kind of um, problem mm. with with something simple like a chest infection or some kind of something that would need to be controlled a legitimate, a le- legitimate um, uh, sort of niggle mm. that, that you or I could go and get treated, no problem, in our work and enable us to carry on with our work. Um, at what point do we 
step into that world and 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 re- require Chris Froome or any rider in a yellow jersey to then turn up and, well, and Froome be said transparent that, about it yeah. and say right from today I am using yeah Froome, example, Froome said it was a personal and it is it is a personal question there mm. may be riders taking medication for things and they wouldn't want the world to know as as you know a, any any member of the public would be the same there is a reason for medical confidentiality Matt what were your thoughts on on yesterday in the Team Sky press conference well Richard. It's funny you should ask because I wasn't actually at the Team Sky press conference. <laughs> I, uh, I did watch the events unfold on Twitter, however. I, I, was, I was doing my laundry, if you must know. I was not, we sent Andrew Hood, our yeah. other reporter, to the press conference. Mm-hmm. Um, but any time like, you get an X amount of questions as a journalist, you have to make them all count. And the, so the niceties and the sort of subtleties yeah, are, exactly. are always lost. And it immediately puts the reporters on the defensive. And they mm-hmm. say, you've got 15 minutes, we're going to do this like this. That said, at least they addressed the issue. Because remember last year, on the I believe it was the first rest day, they they essentially took a tone that said, sporting questions only, Team Sky well, won't address. That, I think that, were you there for that? Yeah. Because that, that has been, it's kind of Chinese whispers, that... I, I checked this because this was reported several months afterwards uh, that there had been an instruction issued by Fran Miller mm-hmm. um, of no th- no t- questions about well, doping, please. Yeah. But actually, what she said was no questions about Cofidis. And there had been a case that, that morning about Remy de Gregorio. Right. Well, it's I just sh- a subtle difference, but it's... No, it's a definite difference because I showed up right apparently right after this mm. all this this had happened and so I didn't know mm. and so you know I guess luckily I didn't ask a question about performance I mean about Cofidis but mm. you know it's it's I think Team Sky's in a sort of uh, yeah. I think Team Sky's in a sort of damned if it does damned if it doesn't point mm. right now because I had a long conversation this morning with Jonathan Vodder's uh, Garmin Sharp's uh, CEO about you know this whole sort of paradox of belief I guess that we find ourselves in right now and and I said, are we at a real danger of missing out on a really sterling human achievement because we're too skeptical right now? And, and he said, you're absolutely, you're absolutely run the risk of missing out on the sort of the apex of human physical performance. But you have no reason not to be given the sports history. And I said, we said, is there anything you can do differently, you know, to, to release things that would that would quell the fears of, of journalists or fans? And, because you know, Garmin has released its blood data, it's done things like that. But once you do that, it's it's you know as a lot of people have said, it's open to misinterpretation. And so I think the unfortunate thing about this sort of data era is that there's a lot of people who think that they know everything about everything. And so we we saw these unfortunate magic numbers appear with the USADA files, you know, 6.5 watts per kilogram, and all of a sudden that's a no. You can't get anywhere close to that, or you must be doping. And and the reality is, is we don't know everything. And so without the proper context, I think that all these numbers really can be more confusing than anything. Mm. And so, you know, for what it's worth, I think Team Sky has done a pretty good job at this point of, of at least talking about it and address and, and acknowledging that this is the climate in which we all live in right now. I think you mentioned, you mentioned Andy Hood there and you mentioned the, the danger of, of missing, uh, you know, an, an astonishing athletic achievement and he wrote a very good piece on mm-hmm. Velo News yeah. which is probably the best one I've read about you know it, he's very good at, at sort of keeping an open mind to that, the, mm-hmm. the, the importance of scepticism um, but also the importance to remember that you know, to consider the possibility that Chris Froome is clean and we should point out there's nothing to suggest that he isn't yeah. beyond his performance and as you also point out we don't know what human beings are capable of. We might know what Lance Armstrong, a doped up Lance Armstrong was capable of on, say, Mont Von 2, but we don't know how that relates to other athletes, you know. Lance Armstrong was a, was a particular kind of athlete. We don't really know what that figure means. You know, we're not talking about with Lance Armstrong, was perhaps not the greatest, you know, natural climber in the world, yet with doping he could become, you know, seven-time Tour de France winner. But what that means, what his performance means in relation to other Riders, we just don't know. Right. And he's been uh, that his performance are, be, are are being used as a kind of benchmark, and it, that could be that could be wrong, misleading. Well, yeah, and, and all kinds of performances from that era. You know, you've got mm. Pantani's performances mm. and Lance's, and, and you know, plenty of performance, plenty of performances at the time that we thought, wow, that's unbelievable, but we didn't think it was actually unbelievable. You know, mm-hmm. and now what I what I do think is unfortunate is is sort of this this mentality that 
you know, maybe I've taken on, but a lot of the press has taken on, is that we are now entitled to convict people based on what we see, as opposed to what we know. Mm. And so I think we want to run a real risk here of sort of poisoning the well if we don't if we don't go about this carefully. And, you know, maybe I can say that because I wasn't around for the first mm. 10 years of covering this and, and, you know, so I haven't been burned like a lot Matt's of people. Matt's part of the new generation. Yeah, we're a very new and a very crisp and a very clean generation. How old are you, Matt? I'm 30 years old. 30. So I'm not yeah. that new. So I think that what, what Team Sky and others are dealing with right now is this sort of collective guilt of the entire profession maybe. And they say, now we're going to do this, you know, better this time. And so I, I think that perhaps they're getting a, a bit of an unfair backlash. But that said, they have the best rider in the race, and he's not the best by a little bit. So, Well, on that topic as well, I mean, we were talking about this earlier on. Um, there's something else that I think is, is slightly misunderstood about his performances in, in the mountains, or on Mont Ventoux in particular. Um, you know, he, he beat Contador by a minute or so. Um, was it? I'm not... I'm, about a minute thirty, vague, a minute thirty minute, or something, yeah. and that is being. This point is being made that he is not just a little bit better, but very much better. He is, but I don't think the margins are as big as we think. I think that what people forget or perhaps don't realise is that anyone who's ridden a bike or or, or or race knows that the the psychological effect of dropping somebody is huge. The 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 surge of of confidence, adrenaline. Dave Brailsford talks about your belief systems. You know, they are, dropping Alberto Condor, realizing that you're strong with him, and dropping him reinforces those belief systems. Conversely, the rider who's dropped, his belief systems collapse. And and I think that you know that, that you can't measure that, and you don't know what effect that is. But it is definitely an effect. And you know, Froome had a carrot to chase in Quintana. He catches him. He's stronger than him. He's been out in front on the mountain virtually the the whole climb. And again, that belief system is reinforced you feel invincible mm -hmm. and feeling invincible is probably the most potent performance enhancing drug that there is mm -hmm. and also Contador you know doesn't feel invincible he feels vincible mm -hmm. and, 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 and that you know every, everything perpetuates everything else yeah I think just to pick up slightly on what Matt was saying and then what you're saying there and take it on um, we're in danger also of forgetting that this is a bike race raced by a pack of cyclists obviously apart from the time trial days and and when we get into these areas of analyzing times on climbs and and you know um trying to calculate whether this performance equates to a, a performance in previous years we're in danger of treating a race competed for by a bunch of cyclists with all manner of tactical thoughts and and different um different agendas we're in danger of trying to pretend that it's a time trial and that mm. actually each rider is racing up that mountain unaided um, by factors such as drafting tactics you know um, mm. Froome's for example two big accelerations came, measuring their effort Froome's two big accelerations really came on territory where Contador and then Quintana would be less at home because they they like to accelerate on the on the steepest slopes and Froome appeared to me to have gone on the slightly shallower um, slopes um, when when the gradient evens out, and I think not to say that you can't have an opinion if you haven't ridden a bike or haven't ridden some of these climbs. But I think even even as am, you know an, a useless amateur cyclist like me who struggled up not Mont Ventoux but certainly up Duez and, and climbs in the Alps and Pyrenees, is you go through good moments and bad moments. If you're riding in a group, you, you of people who ordinarily you're broadly um, similar ability to you have good good times and bad times in the space of a, a one hour climb and you know that's a, that's a kind of my level when you're talking about these guys um turning the screw tr trying to win the tour de france and having having all of that momentum behind him as chris Froome was on mon bon two contador has got completely the opposite um mental you know thoughts going through his mind he the one question he doesn't know is how much has chris Froome got still to give he knows his own limitations he knows the gap is opening you know and so to sort of tidy up a bit of a ragged point it would be really terribly sad to turn the Tour de France into just a, a game of numbers and, and make it into a sort of you know in the mountain stages particularly um, efforts where, judging their efforts based purely on on um, times and you know mm. these uh, a bit disparaging but back of a fag packet um, 
calculations, it's not a time trial. It's, it's the Tour de France and there's so many different variables, so many different factors. And we can't know what's motivating each rider at any given moment. No, we can't. Uh, and I think we'll leave it, the, our analysis of, of all that there. And uh, um, we'll have some light relief, actually. Well, uh, the other day I spoke to uh, Tim Harris, who is uh, driving VIPs on this tour. And he's a, an old British professional rider, uh, quite a character. He's worked on the tour for a few years. And national here's, champion. He was national champion in 1989. He actually says that in this interview, oh, Lionel. You've, sorry. That's, that was a spoiler. So here's Tim Harris. Tim Harris, former leading British professional, British champion. What year was that, 1980? Uh, 1989. And you've been working on the tour for a few years. Yeah, this is my or... seventh year working for Skoda. And what do you do exactly? Basically a VIP driver, so the four Apart main... Apart around the village in the morning. Apart from that, really, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we have four, the four main uh, sponsors have yeah. right are to have uh, VIP cars. So we have uh, guests every day and they ride in front of the race and they go in the helicopter and they stay in a nice hotel in the evening. So they have a, a really exciting day out at the tour. How many? So who are the other drivers? Uh, Stephen Roach. Yeah. Uh, obviously everybody knows. We've got Laszlo Bodrogi mm-hmm. uh, from Hungary, um, who he was, was a rider in football. Yeah, yeah, years yeah, yeah. He raced last year still for the uh, for that American team with the diabetic the diabetic yeah, team. That was yeah, and he yeah. rode for Map Eye and Quick Step mm. and he was a silver medalist uh, at the World Championship time trial. So a really good rider. So and then we've got John Robertson, uh, who was involved with Barlow Weld. Yeah, so how, I mean, the, the two tend to have new drivers every year. How do you how do you get that job, and, and how do you keep it? Normally, it's to do with you've got to have been an ex-professional cyclist and speak a few languages. So, uh, and you've also got to be able to stay away from home for a month in July because not that, and a lot of ex-cyclists are involved in teams. So there's not that many people really who, who, who are suitable for it because of the time away and most. Uh, suitable people are already working on on teams in the race. Presuming you need to be a good driver as well. You have to be quite good, yeah. I mean, have you what? ever got in trouble? They're quite, they're quite. I've over, been over uh, uh, very uh, in the seven years. I've been taken to the gendarmerie four times. Well, I haven't had a sticker taken off, so. Uh, I mean, uh, let's not, you know, let, 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 that's not necessarily for for breaking the law. Let's be clear. It's it's for no, transgressions on the tour. It's basically they have their own speed limits mm. and they have their own speed cameras on the tour. So because it's so dangerous and there's so many people uh, at the side of the road. Obviously, the gendarmerie here are very, very strict, so quite often you go to normal bike races and people just, the caravan goes a bit crazy, but here... I think they, in the past, yeah, at the, the past. tour, that it used to be a free-for-all, didn't yep. it? It was like yep. wacky races, yep. basically. But that's all that's it's all finished, changed completely finished, years. yeah. And there is no speeding at all, I mean, it's a good thing because there's so many people out nowadays mm. uh, that you can't be messing about. It's, it's just too dangerous and people will be getting injured or killed or something. So. Who's the most interesting guest that you've had in your car? Two years ago very rich che- Czechoslovakian guy called Mr. Bakla yeah. and he ended up, he'd never really seen a bicycle race, we were going up one of the mountains in the Tour de France, he says to me ha, oh, I like this sport how much would it cost to have a team? I replied what sort of team? He looks at me and says well the best team obviously, I said about 15 million and later he, that year he bought Quickstep and is now the owner So it's all your fault? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and he's not only the owner of, the, of Quickset, but he's quite involved in, in actually, you know, trying to transform the sport. He he was behind sort of plans for a, a new a new structure to the sport, wasn't he? So yeah, he is. He's involved in the in that. But we don't know much about him. So so what was he? What was your? What were Basically, your he is a, a guy. He left Czech Republic. Mm. Maybe it was Czechoslovakia at the time when he was 19. He moved to New York and he made his money in in, in finance and in banking. Very, very successful. He was 512th richest man in the world, according to Forbes. But he's a, he's a nice guy and very passionate, passionate for cycling. And that was literally his first. Uh, it was one of experience. his first experiences. Yeah, he hadn't really uh, seen much of cycling at all. No, no. And, and do you remember what happened that day that caught his caught his eye? Or the crowds, the atmosphere, the everything around it. I mean, if you, you if you bike up a mountain for the first time and you see every single person we have in the car. They've never seen cycling. They quite often arrive pretty blasé, and they're just thinking they're going to see some people riding on push bikes. But when they see the entourage, the the colours, the crowds, the uh, everything about it, then a lot of people are sold on the sport, which is, is obvious when you see how big it is. Great. And who have you got in your car today? Today I've got a couple of uh, photographers from uh, from the Czech Republic because I work for Skoda. Mm. We have a lot of um, people from from uh, Eastern Europe, and they're making a video film about about the tour. Of France, so uh, it should be an interesting day. And they get a ride in a helicopter, so uh, most people love that. They ride above the race, and uh, it's yeah, it's a good day out, really. Excellent, have a good day.
The Tour de France with humansinvent.com. Innovation, craftsmanship and design. Right, guys, we're, we're still here with the humansinvent.com uh, Tour de France podcast, and we have uh, we were listening there to Tim Harris. Uh, now, Lionel, I think you know something about Tim Harris, because he told us there that um, he had Mr. Bacala in his car a couple of years ago, and provided him with his introduction to cycling, but you know something else about that. Well, just he just happened to mention this morning... Um, that when he had Bacala in his car... Who, some, we should say, owns Omega Pharma owns, Quick Step That's team. right, he owns the team, Czech, Czech billionaire, basically. Mm. Um, yeah, Tim, whenever he's got somebody in the car that he doesn't perhaps know too well, he will ring um, ring home and ask for a quick Google to be done. And um, when Bacala's name basically revealed that he was a billionaire, I think Tim turned so on the charm. So his half turned sits on, there Googling. Turned on the charm mm-hmm. and uh, attracted, uh, basically, Bacala's. Uh, said, you know, how much did it, did it cost to buy um, mm. a team? And, uh, um, yeah, I think Tim thinks that he should get his 10%. Right? <laughs> yeah, probably, yeah. Matt, we, we do a section uh, in, in our podcast where we uh, elect, uh, we have a, a certain prize, and we've got Chiro to introduce it. So here's Chiro. And now, Pedaler de Charme. Chiro there introducing our Pedaler de Charme award. Any nominations today? I should point out, Matt, that this encompasses style on a bike, class on a bike, or uh, or just charm off it as well. Um, so so uh, particularly charming, polite, you know, Nievi got it one day for running over Daniel's foot and then turning around and coming back to apologise. I would like to just rescind Nievi's um, ah. uh, award. From he didn't run over your ago. foot, did no, he? No, he didn't. No, he didn't. But it, it kind of pinching your point. But Nievi, I think this morning, was third in the King of the Mountains competition. Ah. Um, behind yeah. Chris Froome, who's obviously wearing the yellow jersey, and Nero Quintana, who is mm. wearing the white jersey now. So those two jerseys are both um, being worn, which means that the King of the Mountains polka dot jersey has to pass to third place Mikel Nievi this morning. Nothing unusual about that, perhaps, but I think he was taking the mickey a bit to add the polka dot shorts as well. Yeah. You know, just just you're 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 borrowing the jersey. You're it's not... bad enough. <laughs> you know, it's bad enough wearing the polka dot sh- j- uh, shorts if. You're entitled to wear the polka dot <laughs> yeah. jersey. That's bad enough. Yeah. That is a crime yes. against cycling fashion. So to, to to wear them when you're not, you shouldn't even be wearing the jersey. It's just terrible, outrageous. outrageous. Kick him out, Matt. Any 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 nominees for Pedler yeah. and Charm? I mean, for mine today, it, it, it shouldn't be much of a surprise. I'd have to say it's Richie Port for my money. Mm. He brought back. I don't know. Uh, Chris said Chris Froome said ten attacks. I counted less less like three or four but then again i can't see everything he brought back three or four attacks on the final climb and then paced his man back up through the descent and, and he got dropped a few times on when he was bringing the attack like when the group would go and he would get back to the group and then he would go back to the front and so he completely buried himself today on the climb and then he was able to pace his man back up to uh back up to the main gc field on the descent and so richie port chapeau I'll mischievously nominate Alberto Contador <laughs> for for promising to make the rest of the race quite exciting. Uh, okay, so that's about that's about all for tonight. We've got should we do a competition? Um, let's do a competition. What what can our competition be? We've got books to give away. We've got yeah. got. I mean, Lionel's got a house full of books <laughs> that he needs to get rid of because you're getting a bit of grief for that, aren't you? Uh, there's a lot going out at the moment, but um, oh yeah, of course, there's a yeah, lot yeah. going out. Yeah, moment, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, yeah, how about we give away a copy of Sean Kelly's new autobiography, Hunger? Yep, we'll give away a copy of that. I'll also offer a copy of Tour de France 100, my photographic book of the tour. I would offer um, also an e-book that I've done by Dave Brailsford, about Dave Brailsford, sorry, called Mastermind, available only on Amazon. But I can't give away an e-book, so that was actually just a plug. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's a it's a short ebook about Dave Brailsford. A good time to read it, I would have thought. Mm. It takes you. It's part of a series called Ninety Minutes. It takes you about ninety minutes to read. Only two pounds ninety nine. Uh, I would offer it as a prize, but I can't. Uh, sorry about that. So you're gonna have to buy it. Yeah, you're gonna have to buy okay. it. So the question: <laughs> What's the question to win a copy of Hunger by Sean Kelly and Tour de France One Hundred by Richard Moore? The is, question is. And um, guess who will be third on the time trial? Good third one. in the time trial. Tweet at humans invent. Yeah. Uh, your answer. Tweet at humans. Tweet at humans invent. Hashtag. Uh, TDF. 
competition. Okay. And the winner of the person who guesses third place rider in the time trial will win those two books. Uh, so, thank you very much, Matt, for joining us this evening. It's been a pleasure having you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Have you enjoyed it? I've, I, I, it was the highlight of my day. Do you think you'll be back? I'd like to be back if you'll have me. Could we, we could we just ask Matt, as you rode the attack, mm. for your sort of, in a couple of sentences, impression of the final climb, An Annecy Semnos, where the tour basically concludes on Saturday? So imagine you have a mouthful of loose teeth, right? And then imagine being kicked in them. Ouch. <laughs>